Well, good morning, everybody. I hope this video finds everybody doing well. And um, thank you for clicking on this video, and I hope that you'll take a moment or two at least consider giving it a thumbs up. And, uh, you know, go ahead and share it with your bestest of buddies. But what I want to do in the introduction here is get this recorded before the breeze comes up. That seems to be a reoccurring problem here in New Mexico. But um, what I have here is a full stock Hawking gun. And it's actually a smoothbore. And uh, before I get into actually shooting it, um, I just kind of want to give you a little bit of background how it was that I came into possession of this gun. Now, I will tell you right off the bat, I am the third possessor of this smoothbore. But let me tell you how I came to get this. Years ago, when I lived in Wisconsin, um, I built a bow for a gal. And um, I, I don't remember right off, the hand, uh, right off the top of my head if it was 40 or 45 pounds. And it made it out of hard rock maple. It was a really good shooting bow. A couple of years later, um, the gal lost interest in the bow. So they came to my trade table. Now by this time, I know this couple very well because I already rendezvoused with them multiple times. So anyhow, they came to my trade table with the bow and they wanted me to sell it for them because they were going to be leaving most of that day. They were going to be gone. They had to go to town for whatever reason. So anyhow, they told me what they wanted for cash for the bow. And then they stated anything above that you can just keep. So I figured out what I might want for the bow on top of what they wanted for cash and I put it on the table. Well, later that day, a gentleman came by, someone else I had rendezvoused with a time or two before, and he asked me what I wanted for that bow, so I explained to him how much I wanted for it. And then he goes, are you willing to do some trading? I says, well, yeah, what have you got? He says, well, I can give you cash, and that cash amount happened to be what the couple wanted for the bow. And then he says, and I have this full stock Hawking with a barrel. Now, at that time, and unbeknownst to me, somebody had already been trying to fit some hardware. And when, when I look at the, the gun, and you can probably see it, the, um, the uh, trigger is setting proud, the tang is setting proud, but I have to explain. When I got the gun, all I got was the stock, and I got the barrel. So I took the trade because you could probably see right here, it's left-handed. Well, unbeknownst to me at that time, my friend shot left-handed. And um, being the trader I was, and I still am, when I take things in... Um, from a friend to try to sell and they tell me what they want what I get is what I give back to them because I I don't need to make a profit I'm only here to have fun and you know share in good camaraderie if I can pay for my expenses going to a rendezvous I am perfectly happy with that so anyhow I took the cash and I took this in on trade now remember it's two two pieces the barrel and the uh, stock so anyhow, my, my friend and his wife came back and I says, hey Dave, I, I sold your bow, here's the cash. And he was happy. And I says, oh, wait a minute. I also took this in on trade and it belongs to you also. So I handed him the stock, handed him the barrel, and he looks at it and he says, hey, that's left-handed. I shoot left-handed. And then he's looking at it closer and, and seeing, you know, there's no butt plate, there's no, um, no lock, no triggers, no trigger guard no tank just a plain tube and a stock and he says well you go ahead and keep it he says because i'll never get this thing built i said okay cool but at least i did what i thought was conscionable offering him the value of everything that was taken in for trade and cash 
So anyhow, I was kind of proud to get this, and I knew that it was going to take some work and some time, and so I immediately got online and I ordered an LNR roller lock, ordered the tang, ordered the trigger guard, because here again, this is a hawk in style, but I did not realize at the time how much of the wood had already been, been removed from the first owner and why the second owner was wanting to trade maybe because he recognized that things weren't going to fit perfectly but um before i get to the most unique thing about this smooth bore um if you can look i built the front sight for it and i also put a front sight on it now i know i know traditionally smooth bores don't have a front sight I don't care okay I don't care but the most unique thing about this smooth bore is that the barrel is seamless hydraulic tube think about that for a minute <laughs> it's not your traditional gun barrel it's a seamless hydraulic tube so obviously I had to buy a, a tap, you know, cut the threads for the tang, insert the tang, um, drill the touch hole. Now the touch hole is lined up perpendicular where, it was, where it's supposed to be, but unfortunately I got it maybe a couple thousand, <clears throat> just maybe a little bit too further back um, because it's not dead center in the pan. But the gun shoots fine. So once I got the gun built and um, got it out to test when I lived in Wisconsin, what I did to proof test this seamless hydraulic tube is I started first with 50 grains of 3F. Now I don't recall if it was Go-X or if it was Elephant, I just don't remember that little detail. But I, I used 3F. So I started and obviously I had the, the gun secured with a long rope to pull the trigger. So started with the 50 grains, gun shot, no problem. Increased it 10 grains every time I reloaded it for the test. So eventually I ended up proofing this at 110 grains of 3F black powder no problems whatsoever now I chose to use 3F because we already will recognize that there's a tremendous amount of pressure built up with that much 3F and I wanted to make sure for myself and having been a mechanic all my life I already understood the strength of seamless hydraulic tube but you know just to be safe I proofed it up to 110 grains, 3F gunpowder, and had no issues. Now, my main purpose in wanting to keep the gun was to obviously have a smooth bore for turkey hunting. Well, in the process of getting this thing built, we had moved from Wisconsin here to New Mexico. And I've shown a view of the Manzano Mountains right here in the past. There are turkey up here, and there's a large flock of them, several large flocks. The problem with this turkey season here is there's only a spring turkey hunt. There's no fall turkey hunt. For me to go on a fall turkey hunt, I'd have to go about 100 miles, and I'm just not going to do that for a turkey. I'll, I'll just run to my local grocery store and just buy a butterball. <laughs> but... In the spring, they have the youth hunt first. Now, in the state of New Mexico, you're not supposed to be putting out bait piles for turkey unless you're on private property. The problem with that spring hunt, the daddies of the youth put out bait. Now, don't get me wrong. I've scouted in the past. I found the turkey roosts. I found everything that I needed to to have in my mind when I go turkey hunting where the turkey are. Well, the one and only time I bought a turkey tag, I went up there, I scouted, found where they were roosting, saw their patterns, everything else. 
The day after the uh, youth hunt was over with, then the regular season started. So I went up to that spot where I found the roost, and lo and behold, spread out in a little uh, in a in an area are abandoned mounds of corn. I'm a little ticked off at that because. As a hunter myself, why are you teaching your kids to do something that's illegal? So I kind of gave up on that turkey hunt, especially up here. So anyhow, um, the caliber is 69 caliber, which is 15 gauge. And the ball that I, or the mold that I had bought, bought to cast the ball is a .680. And I use a 20 thousandths patch because I want that ball to be very tight. Go, going down and coming out of the barrel. And just in case anybody's curious, this lead ball weighs uh, 0.4, well, 470 grams. So that's a big ball. Now, the purpose of this video, now that I've got all of this out of the way, is that when I lived in Wisconsin and I did do some shooting with this, it appeared to me that at 30 yards the bullet just went straight down to the ground so at that point I had it in mind that I couldn't get any more than 30 yards so what I'm going to do is I'm going to back my table up to my 30 yard marker I'm going to put a um, target on the board and I'm going to load this up with 90 grains of 2F and I'm going to shoot it through my chronograph because I just out of, for curiosity sakes I just want to see what a 470 grain bullet uh, <clears throat> can gain in a velocity, feet per second, going through that chronometer, that chronograph. And at the same time, I just want to see how low um, this thing actually shoots at 30 yards. I don't plan on hunting with it. I'm just doing this for my own knowledge. So stay tuned. So before I finish getting set up here, I found my turkey call. <laughs> I hadn't been into that particular shooting pouch for about 15 years, so now the looking for it is over. Um, but some of you may be wondering, and in case I forgot to mention, the uh, lock is a L&R roller lock, and the uh, double set triggers are Davis. And you may also be wondering or curious at this time, how does this do with shot? Well, the, the load that I worked up was 50 grains of 2F with, if I remember correctly, one ounce of number five shot. And at 20 yards, let me get a little close, the breeze is picking up, but at 20 yards, I can get uh, through two tin cans back to back, which is sufficient enough for taking a turkey. So anyhow, I'm going to finish getting set up here and then I'll load the uh, smooth bore up and we'll take a few shots. So to correct an earlier statement, I think I'm using a 10 thousandths patch and I'm also putting a felt wad on top of the powder charge. So let's see what this thing's going to do. Well, that was memorable. <laughs> um, let me see if I can zoom in and we'll see where the round ball hit. I can see from here it hit pretty low. Um, that's to be expected. Actually, before I do that, let me get the number off the chronograph. Well, that's surprising. 1719. I'm going to get uh, loaded up, go uh, put a number one on the target where the round ball hit. Let me show you where it hit first and then I'll accomplish that. So obviously at 30 yards that's the drop. I'm gonna go get, take a tape measure and actually measure that. Stay tuned. Okay that was a three inch drop. And in case anybody's wondering or curious, um, I am using 4F and I'm using one grain of powder in the flash pan. Now if you're not familiar with the L&R locks, 
uh, they typically have a much deeper pan than say like your silo lock and perhaps maybe some of the others and some of you may be wondering why I'm putting a wad over the powder charge there's a feller on another channel and he's done a few videos showing that you can actually increase accuracy by putting a wad or a patch over the powder and then run your patch ball on top of that and that makes sense just simply because the wad or the the patch itself is actually taking up the fire instead of the fire burning your patch now let me grab that patch because I did pick it up and I just kind of want to show you this here's the patch and as you can see it's not burnt at all so there just may be something to that double patching or at least putting a patch on top of the powder charge and to be honest with you guys at this point in looking at this patch I would not have any reservations of using this again okay I'm loaded up ready to take the next shot let's see what happens well let's see where she hit now looky there maybe two and a half inches higher I actually aimed just a little bit higher with this one to try to compensate for that three inch drop but uh, let me go get the number off the chronograph 1649 I'm gonna load up and take another shot so just real quick I found the patch and it's still wet from you know my saliva but you can look it's not burnt through at all um, I can't wait to get out here with my rifles and see if putting a patch over the powder really is beneficial or not but I'm gonna walk up mark off the target and uh, see if I can't even recover a couple of those uh, felt wads okay this time I did not put the ten thousands patch around the ball I just dropped it down the barrel on top of that felt wad I just kind of want to see um, what the difference is going to be Sixteen oh seven. Let me uh, get a close up from where I'm at, and you guys might have already picked it up. It's actually a little low right, but it's actually above that first shot. And there's that third shot. But hey, guys, what do you think about? seamless hydraulic tube for a gun barrel gonna load up one more and see what I can get for a number and um, probably call it quits get a little warm out here already okay here we go All right, let's see what we got here. Okay, I think you guys can figure out where that fourth shot placed. A little low, uh, but just above the one that hit the bullseye. Actually, that's not half bad for just guessing where the sights needed to be when I soldered them in place. Well, let me go get the number up the chronograph. 1552. 
Now, whether this will make a difference or not, I don't know. The last round ball I shot and what I have left have a little bit of tin in them. I had to walk up to the house and get my short starter. So whether that makes a difference or not, but obviously from shot number one at 1719 to shot number four at 1552, it's dropped a whole lot of feet per second. But yet, even with the droppage in the velocity, I'm still hitting the target pretty much in the same area at 30 yards. And you also have to remember too, is that when it comes to these heavier round balls, like this 69 caliber, what I say, 470 grains, I think it was, there's a lot of energy still in that round ball. I would just be curious to see just how far this thing does shoot and or maybe do a multiple board uh, penetration test and that's probably what I should do but that'll be done on a later date so I'm gonna shoot one more shot so I have five numbers so I can kinda get an average and um, at that point I'll wrap everything up Not sure what happened, but that one actually registered 989. So I'm wondering if the ambient temperature and the electronics heating up are not affecting what these numbers are at this point. But I'm gonna go pull the target and I'm gonna try to find a few of those round balls so we can see what they look like. So stay tuned and I'll be right back at you. I probably should have paid a little more attention to the movement of the sun because as you can see as well as I can the shadow is now casting over that last sensor so as opposed to the chronograph heating up I think that shadow uh, gave me that bad reading that's my story and I'm sticking to it okay I managed to recover a few Here's one of them. You can kind of see how much that flattened out as opposed to one that had a little bit of tin in it. You can kind of, let me get repositioned here. You can kind of see maybe what, let me go sideways. I don't know if you guys can really see anything or not doing that. Let me, um, let me get repositioned and put these on the uh, table over there and maybe we can get a better view. Okay. My first two shots were pure lead round ball, okay? And you can see how much the impact into that dirt pile mushroomed them out. Obviously, with a pure soft lead ball, there's enough energy, and in particular, this one right here, to just about flatten that entire thing right out. Now, the other shots were the round ball with a little bit of tin in them. And this one here, this one here didn't do too bad. <laughs> As you can, guys can, can kind of see it. Hope, let me look at the camera instead of the round ball. But that one here has got a tremendous amount of deformation in it. But then these two that I picked up, you can still see they're obviously a round ball but this would be you know the impact side and that would also be the impact side okay so these three here were balls cast with a little bit of tin in them not much but just a little bit and then these two on top once again just to reiterate were pure soft round ball so anyhow guys um Thanks for watching. If anybody needs these numbers once again, 
me focus the camera on it. It's not going to change anything I do, but the first shot was 1719. Second shot, 1649. Third shot, 1607. Fourth shot, 1552. And I'm throwing out the fifth shot just simply because I showed everybody the shadow across that sensor. So anyhow, thanks for watching, and I hope everybody will have a great day and a great upcoming week, because I know I am. I'm going elk hunting with my brother. Bye.